so we've seen the uh, house where Isaac Newton lived. Now, the strange thing is Isaac Newton, when he was a boy, lived in that house, but his father died a couple of months after Isaac Newton was born, and his mother remarried and moved away and left Isaac Newton to be looked after by his grandmother in the house you've just seen. And then, at the age of 19, Isaac Newton went off to study at Cambridge University. But he was only there a couple of years when England was hit by an awful disease called bubonic plague. And thousands of people were dying everywhere. So when the bubonic plague struck, Isaac Newton left Cambridge and came back to this little house called Wolfsthorpe Manor. And it was a good thing that he did because it was in the first three years after he went back to his little family farmhouse that Isaac Newton made the three great discoveries that have changed the world. Now, you all know about Isaac Newton sitting in his garden and an apple fell from the apple tree on his head. Here's a picture of the apple tree that sits still today in Isaac Newton's garden. And it's said that he was sitting on a bench and this apple fell on his head, which made him think about gravity. And a very impolite French scientist called Voltaire, he made a nasty comment. He said, the English are not very intelligent and it needs something falling on their head to make them think about anything. But the fact is, Voltaire, the French scientist, was just a bit jealous of Newton. Now, Newton wasn't a particularly nice chap. You probably wouldn't have enjoyed having supper with him. He was quite grumpy and quite difficult to chat to. But he was a great thinker. So to be a great thinker, you don't have to be a very nice person. Now, one day, a bright sunny day, a little like today in Timpu, Isaac Newton was sitting in a small room on upstairs in their little house and he was looking at light. And to look at light, he had a candle. And he had various pieces of glass and he was looking to see what effect the glass had on the light. And the blinds were all drawn in this little room, black blinds, and he had one piece of glass, which was a prism. You may have seen this in school. And he just put it down. He wasn't actually bothering about the prism. He was doing something else with another piece of glass here. But there was a hole in the black blind. And a little streak of sunlight came through the black blind. And just by accident, it happened to hit the prism. And he was amazed to notice on the wall over there, he saw the colours of the rainbow. And he asked himself, my goodness, where did these colours come from? Perhaps they come from the glass, because nobody then, in the middle of the 1600s, nobody understood what made colour. Nobody understood why your tego is blue, and the little plastic thing there is orange, and why you've got a red colour showing here. Nobody understood colours. So he was amazed to see this. And so he took his prism and he arranged this little beam of sunlight coming by accident through a hole in the blind. And he put his prism there and he saw the colours of the rainbow. Now, you've seen pictures in your textbook of a prism and the colours of the rainbow coming out. But he asked himself, where do these colours come from? And he worked out that the white light coming into the spectrum got broken up into the colours. Before that, everybody had thought that white light, the sort that's reflected off my cups, that white light was pure. It, was, it wasn't made of anything, it was the purest sort of light. But what Isaac Newton discovered looking at this was that white light was made up of 
all the different colours combined together. And that discovery was made just because there happened to be a hole in his blind and it by accident happened to strike the prism. It wasn't a great design of an experiment in a big laboratory. It was just an accident. And so Newton discovered the visible spectrum. And we'll talk a bit more about the visible spectrum and about light waves in our next programme. But what I'm talking about today is the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's called electromagnetic spectrum, first of all, because we're talking about electromagnetic waves. And I'm going to say a bit more about a, what an electromagnetic wave is. And the word spectrum is a Latin word which means a range. Now, have you seen a piano? Yes. If you think of a piano, it goes dong, 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 dong. A whole range of notes. And as we learnt in our programme on sound, deep notes have a long wavelength, high notes have a short wavelength but they are sound waves. But there's a range of wavelengths, and the word for a range of wavelengths is a spectrum. So when we say electromagnetic spectrum, what we actually mean is the whole range of wavelengths of electromagnetic waves. And those wavelengths range from thousands of miles a wavelength through to a wavelength which is the size of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So it's a much greater range than you would get on a piano, but don't forget, a piano is sound waves which are not electromagnetic waves. So Newton, through seeing the colours come out, he discovered just one tiny, tiny bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in fact, if I were to make a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible light that we can see forming colours from our prism, the visible light is a tiny bit of it. If I drew a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum which stretched from the physics laboratory here in Motitang High School all the way to Babesa, the end of Babesa, you imagine a diagram, a line that long. The visible light occupies only one inch of that long line. So the electromagnetic spectrum, imagine it, a line going from Motitang to the far end of Babesa. The visible light that we were looking at in the prism is only one inch of that line. And we'll talk a bit more about what's on the outside. So Isaac Newton's contribution was to realize that light is made up of many, many, many colours. And to prove it, because people said, oh, well, how do you know the light didn't come, the colours didn't come from the glass? So to prove it, he took two prisms. He used this prism to break the light up into its different colours, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then he took a second prism and put it here, and he fed the colours into here, and what do you think came out? Again. So he first of all split the white light up into colours, and then he took the colours and got this prism to bring them back again, and he got white light out again. And so he proved that white light is made up of colours, the beginnings of our understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum. Well. Isaac Newton did that in his little room in Wolfsthorpe Manor, just by accident. Nowadays, you can use an instrument called a spectrometer. And you have to learn about this if you do science in class 12. You may, have you come across a spectrometer? Not yet, but if you do science in class 12, one of the things you have to learn is the adjustments of a spectrometer. And there are about seven or eight adjustments you have to do. And you've got this bit of it,
which is called a collimator. And you put a bright light here. You could use daylight or sunlight. And this organizes the light into a nice beam. And one of the things you have to do is adjust the collimator. And then you put a prism here. And you shine the light into the prism. And it comes out here. And this is a telescope that you can see the light coming out. So white light in, colored lights coming out here, all the red through to violet lights coming out here, and you have to adjust the telescope so as to get everything in focus, and you have to adjust the prism so that it's all level. And so this is the spectrometer. And you can measure very accurate angles because here is an angle scale. So a spectrometer is used for measuring the angles that the colored light comes out from a prism. They come out at different angles. So when you learn in class 11 or 12 about adjustments of a spectrometer, this is the spectrometer. Well now, this is really quite an old fashioned idea now. In laboratories, nobody used this sort of instrument. We now have electronic spectrometers, which you don't have to adjust, which do it all automatically, and you can feed the output into computers and calculate the wavelengths and this sort of thing. And if you had an unknown chemical, you didn't know what it was made of, you could actually set fire to it, put the burning chemical here, and it gives out light. It comes through here, and the light from the burning chemical is split up by the prism, and it comes into the telescope, and it will give out some colors. And you can measure the angles that these colors come off. And then, knowing the angles, you can calculate the wavelengths or the frequencies of what comes off. And from analyzing the colors that come off from this burning chemical, you can actually work out what the chemical is made of. One of the easiest things to do, get a flame, perhaps in your gas stove at home, and sprinkle with some salt, ordinary household salt on it. Do you know what salt is made of? Have you learned the two chemicals in salt? No? Well, salt, yet chlorine and a metal called sodium. Salt is sodium chloride. Now, sodium, when it burns, gives off a very, very special series of yellow lights at special frequencies. So if you sprinkle salt over a flame, you'll see you get a yellow color. Try it at home. And so if I've got an unknown substance here and I burn it there and I get these special yellow lights coming out, which I can accurately measure with the telescope, then I can tell you sodium is in that unknown compound. So a spectrometer is very useful for chemical analysis. And don't forget who we have to thank for the whole idea is good old Sir Isaac Newton. And he discovered it quite by accident, but he had the brilliant brain to be able to work out what the results of his observation were. And this is science. Science is observing things and then using your brain to work out why what you see is happening. And science encourages skills of observation. When you go around, whether you're walking to school or whether you're sitting at home, try and observe what's happening. You've just observed, for example, that my mobile phone is ringing. What sort of waves is that giving out? giving out sound waves, high waves, high tone, low tone. And then when I press and say, hello, Michael Rutland, uh, BNLI, uh, uh, Tenzin, good morning. May I call you back in 20 minutes? I'm just using your call as an example of electromagnetic waves. I'll call you back. Now, that was somebody up in Motitang there from the National Legal Institute. How did their voice get here onto my phone? 
what sort of waves? The network, the B, B mobile network, but what sort of waves does the B mobile network use? Ele absolutely right, electromagnetic waves, radio waves, which come from BNLI up the road there, and they go way up to the sky, and then they are rebroadcast, and they come to my mobile phone, all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And all that we know about the electromagnetic spectrum started with Isaac Newton in his little room. So Newton showed with his two prisms that if I combine the colours, I'll get, what would I get? White. White light. So what he did was he took a little metal disc and he painted the various colours on the disc. And he thought, well now, if I rotate this very quickly, the eye will get all the various colours all at once. And what will the eye see? White. White, white colour. Absolutely. So this little thing is called Newton's disc. And thank you to your physics laboratory for letting me borrow, borrow it. And if I rotate it quickly, which means, first of all, getting the pulleys right, and you see the disc begins to look white. So all the colours are combining together in your eye to give you white light. And this little thing is called Newton's disc. The faster it goes, the better the combination. White light. The disc looks white. Good chap, Isaac Newton. Learn about his life. Because you know, when he was at school, he was very quiet. He didn't have any friends. He was a bit isolated. The other kids didn't really like him because he spent too much time thinking rather than playing football or whatever. And uh, so you don't have to be a great sports person in order to be a good thinker. You can be both. And Isaac Newton, you know, when he was a baby, he nearly died, nearly died. And if he died, I wonder how long we'd have had to have waited until somebody discovered the beginnings of the electromagnetic spectrum. And just one other funny thing about Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton became a member of parliament in London, like a member of the National Assembly. And sometimes you may read in newspapers people saying, oh, the members of the National Assembly, not all of them speak. Some of them sit there and don't say anything. Well, Isaac Newton, when he was a member of the British Parliament, he only said one sentence during the whole of his time as a member of the British Parliament. And do you know what that sentence was? Was it something really clever about science or talking about economic affairs? The only sentence Newton said during his whole time in the British Parliament was, please close that window, it's cold. And that was it. So Isaac Newton, jolly interesting chap, the beginnings of the electromagnetic spectrum. Well now, we'll go on and talk a little more about the electromagnetic spectrum. Thank you very much. We're delighted to be up here in Mottitang High School in your physics laboratory. And if you do go on to learn about the spectrometer, there we are. So the electromagnetic spectrum is very useful too in medicine. And let's come to meet a very old friend of mine who arrived from England yesterday. So we've come down to the Jomalhari Hotel this morning to have a cup of coffee and to meet Sue Gross. Sue is a very senior physiotherapist at a big hospital in London, and 
So I'm hoping that Sue will be able to just quickly tell us one or two uses of the electromagnetic spectrum in medicine. Sue. Thank you. We use the electromagnetic spectrum in medicine, in physiotherapy, and doctors also use it. In physiotherapy, we can use the infrared part, the red part here. This can be used to warm skin, which can help increase blood circulation. That may help relieve pain and also to relax muscles. Infrared can also be used through a laser, either a low power laser to help increase the rate of healing, or a very powerful laser for use in surgery. Here, the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, this can be used for treating skin conditions. It can help to heal up the skin and it can uh, uh, improve the appearance of skin. X radiation can be used to make images, as you know. It can help to show whether a broken bone has healed enough for someone to start walking again. X-rays are also sometimes used uh, for treating cancers in a more powerful, at a more powerful dose. Good. Thank you, Sue. Well, You're Sue welcome. will be here in Bhutan for a month and was here many years ago and helped very much with the development of the physiotherapy department in the hospital. So, Sue, enjoy your second visit to Bhutan. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've just come to visit the managing director of the Bhutan Broadcasting Service. Uh, again, an old friend of mine, Mr. Tinley Dorji. And Tinley, I'd be very grateful. Could you just say a word about how the electromagnetic spectrum is useful for the Bhutan Broadcasting Service? Well, Michael, without the electromagnetic spectrum, BBS would not be on air. We have radio transmissions and TV transmissions which uses the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Well, the radio is in the lower frequency band. FM radio is in the VHF, which is the very high frequency band, and so is the television broadcast. And perhaps we should emphasize, Tinley, that a lot of people think there exist television waves but, in fact, I think you will be able to tell us <coughs> how television gets to your television set. Television signals are also in the electromagnetic uh, field. It travels as electromagnetic waves, and then it reaches the television sets. It is basically transmitted the same as, a, as an FM radio station. And it's almost in the same frequency range as well. So we actually, there are no such things as television waves. It is all in the electromagnetic radiation. For VHF television, I think it is just above uh, 170 megahertz or thereabouts. Right. And uh, it is broadcast the same as the FM radio signals. There is no separate television waves as such. We all use the same pool of right. Uh, right. frequencies. Right. And we're always changing channels, aren't we? That, of course, and I see your remote issue. control sitting in front of you there. This, when I say, okay, we go from channel 4 BBS to channel 5 BBS, I mean, I've tuned it to channel 4 and 5, but this has infrared radiation coming out from here, and that's what we use to change the channels. And this infrared is also in the electromagnetic radio frequency spectrum. So there we are. Not only do you depend on the electromagnetic spectrum to get your radio broadcasts on your radio and to get your television picture on your television set, you also depend on the electromagnetic spectrum, a little bit of it, to actually change channels with your remote control. So next time you're sitting at home flicking through the channels, remember what's coming out of your remote control are infrared waves part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Thank you, Tinley, and good luck to BBS. You're most welcome, and Michael. Thank and you for broadcasting my little physics programs on your new channel, too. Oh, we're glad to do it. A good program is always welcome. Thank you.